Sunday, September 18, 1983, Bellevue, Nebraska. You go barefoot again, you little geek, and Dad's gonna ground you. Spare an extra paper? Sure. No. Yes, ma'am, I'll tell him as soon as he gets home. Who's that, Lanny? That was Mrs. Heffron, Dad. Danny didn't deliver her paper either. That's not like Danny. and Brownlee's got their papers. I'm worried. Slow down. I don't want to miss him. Relax. After more calls from neighbors and no word from their son, Leonard and Judy Eberly searched for Danny along his paper route. There's his bike. Thirteen-year-old newsboy Danny Joe Everly was gone. The statewide search for him quickly became one of the biggest child stalker investigations in the country, the most massive and costly in government history. Police officers and hundreds of volunteers searched three days for any sign of Danny. Nobody goes home till we find this boy, understand? Yes, sir. act stumped the local sheriffs. They called in a member of the nation's most elite group of investigators, men and women who track down killers by going inside the criminal mind. I'm Jim Sicking, and this is a story from the Psych File. The profiler assigned to the Everly case was the FBI's top behavioral scientist and criminologist, Robert Ressler. His psych files expertise, violent crimes. He had tracked and studied the behavior of the most notorious criminals, 
Now he would work with Agent John Evans from the FBI's Omaha Bureau to narrow the pursuit. I mean, what kind of a sicko are we dealing with here, Bob? I mean, people are scared that we've got a child killer on the loose and that this is just the first. You know, I have a boy about his age. Yeah, I know, John. I'd be concerned, too. You say there were uh, no signs of a struggle? No. Yeah. And the family's clean, you said? Clean. Yeah. He may very well have been a stranger then. You've uh, started checking out known molesters? Uh-huh. Well, they have a way of smooth talking, these kids. I was called into the case because I had the uh, better part of 10 years collecting data, doing research uh, on violent offenders, serial killers, multiple killers, and probably had more experience than anybody uh, in, in the FBI at that particular time in this, uh, in this type of work. Why leave the body in the open on the side of the road here? Why not dump it back here in the Missouri? Did he know about a river? My guess, he's not from this area. I looked at the entire picture the way the killer saw it. At the time that he saw it, it was cold, it was clear, and there was moonlight. The fact of where he dumped the body at the side of the road, I got the feeling he wasn't much bigger than the guy he was carrying. I don't know. The kid was only 80 pounds. He couldn't carry him any farther than this. That means he's a small guy. So my money's on a little wimp. A little wimp with a big knife. There are multiple wounds, but none deep enough to have been fatal. Loss of blood is the cause. This may be a first killing. An amateur out of his league someone inexperienced, maybe a kid himself. What strange cuts? Uh, they're intended to cover the bites. Bites? Come on. Cannibalism? No. It's what children do when they get mad. They bite their attempt to get control. That's what makes me think he's very young, immature, confused, then angry. In a killing where there's a lot of interpersonal conflict, uh, identity problems, biting sometimes occurs. So the cuts on top of biting are to cover his tracks. Most of your audience is not aware that bite marks can be red like fingerprints. Our suspect was. Well, how did he know that? That's how Ted Bundy, uh, our nation's most notorious serial killer, was prosecuted uh, by bite mark evidence. Uh, that gave me additional insight. I felt that our killer would be an avid reader of detective magazines where he would have picked up that kind of information. It's odd. We haven't found any bruises from the ropes. He probably wasn't tied up during captivity. Tying may have come later, an ID he'd read about in some smut somewhere. This is a guy who uses his hands. I see him as a manual laborer. He's young, so he's probably had a limited education. The lab's trying to locate the rope manufacturer. I've already sent in some fibers. Offhand, I don't recognize it. It sure looks like a Boy Scout knot. Come on, Travis. Hey, Bob. What have we got so far? Forming a picture now, but one thing sure, Sheriff, the killer's white. Well, look at the neighborhood. You have to blend in. The town was held hostage. It was held hostage because it was afraid to move. It was afraid to relax. It was afraid to let their children out and play. Detectives normally look at clues hoping to tie a suspect to a crime. Wrestler looked for what type of person would fit that crime's unique psychological profile. He concluded the killer was young, not from the area, but now working at a menial job nearby. A loner, ashamed of his needs, but smart enough to try and hide them. Wrestler further theorized that the killer was under stress from recent personal trauma. He knew from his experience that some profound event could trigger violence. What Ressler didn't know yet was his profile fit a mechanic at nearby Offutt Air Base, 20-year-old airman John Jubert. Hey, Mac, 
Hey, there's your freaky ex-roommate that had such a big crush on you. Give it a rest, huh? That guy's pathetic. He looks so brokenhearted. Hey, baby, blow us a kiss! <laughs> Shift workers, janitors, produce handlers, any low-level blue-collar worker up at dawn and off on Sundays. He's white, early 20s, max, has uh, zero self-esteem, a loser, someone with no control over any aspect of his life. With someone Agent Evans and Sheriff Thomas, Rustler formed a task someone force to quickly investigate every lead from his profile that could narrow their pursuit of the weaker. killer. Someone who had a lousy childhood with, uh, with no friends or family to anchor him. Except, of course, for his lurid pals who tie people up in magazine photos. Well, you don't get these ideas from looking at girly magazines, folks. These are straight out of trashy detective rags. Now, we need the names of any sex offenders in the area with rap sheets. How far back do you want us to go? Well, what, five? Yeah, say about five years. Yeah. That's work, man. Tell that to a parent. Look. Time is not on our side. This killer is still conflicted and has no control over his victims. So there's sure to be another attack, and it will cost another child his life. Now let's move before he strikes again. Go. A week later, September 30th, it looked like the pieces of the profile puzzle had come together. The task force arrested a suspect who was out on bail for molesting a child the same day Danny Eberly disappeared. People were crying for somebody to be arrested. He was uh, so perfect, you could literally say he jumped off the pages of my profile. The age was right, he was young, he was a loner, and he was single. And he's a school dropout who had trauma in his life prior to the crime. On September 18th, did you assault two boys in Iskey Park? No, sir, I did not. On September 18th, did you murder Danny, Joe, Eberly? No way. This sleazoy tied a kid up, molested him, and put a knife to his neck, for God's sakes. With a big difference, he didn't cut him. This guy only uses weapons to coerce kids. He's not a killer. I'm sorry. Danny Eberly's assailant didn't molest him. He murdered him, damn it. But he didn't show truthful. Come on, we got our guy. Pat, I can see it in his eyes. This guy does not have the killer instinct. I'm telling you, our guy is still out there. Okay, let's have a big Troop 282 welcome for our new assistant leader, John Jubert. John was an Eagle Scout in Maine, and now he's in the Air Force. Meanwhile, police followed Ressler's recommendation, and hours later released the only suspect they had. I was so mad because uh, even though we just started the case, I thought we had the bastard who had, who had caused this family in this area so much grief. I stepped back and I thought, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go along with Bob Ressler's intuition and experience. And um, really, that's our best, I felt that was our best chance of catching this guy. Go okay, guys, guys, listen up. John's going to show us how to tie a taut line hitch. Any helpers? Yeah, me. Uh, no, it's okay. I can use a chair leg. No, do it to me. Looks like you got yourself a volunteer. The killer was unsure of his identity, and he was angry. I firmly felt that he was going to strike again. Ready, set, go! Chris, your hat! But, Mom, it'll mess up my hair. You want to catch cold? Come here. Bye. It was a cold morning, but Sue Walden, who usually drove her son Chris to school, allowed him to walk with his friend. Here? Uh, okay. Be 
him, Chris. 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 Another child gone, a town terrified, a likely suspect had just been released. With few leads, Robert Ressler knew the stakes had risen. Now it would be up to him to check the growing panic that gripped the state of Nebraska. Picture for the backpack, the body all around, okay. every angle, all right? Yeah. Give me five, 25 feet around the perimeter, okay? Yeah. Who are these people? Sorry. Sorry. If they don't have a job, I want them out of here. My mind was spinning. Now, what went wrong? Why didn't we catch this guy? It was really a bad scene. Uh, the tenor of everybody's feelings was just depression. Yeah. Come on, now. Stay back. Stay back. Look, they both walked in and only the killer came out. Why can't we get this monster? Oh, we will, but he is getting more organized, taking more risks. After the second homicide, of course, now it, it became clear to me that we were definitely uh, seeing an individual who's becoming more proficient at killing. Uh, we were seeing a serial killer in the making. Grab a beer with us? Would you mind knocking? You twisted freak. You still reading that junk? I wonder if Mac moved out on you. Each day without a lead caused greater anxiety. The task force worked frantically against time, yet it also had to calm the community. Meanwhile, Ressler could see the criminal in his mind's eye. But he needed a clearer focus. He decided on something bold that had worked for him in other investigations. He would use hypnosis on the other newsboys. Reaching into their unconscious might reveal a picture that matched the killer in Ressler's mind. I'm crossing the parking lot. I've just finished my deliveries. What do you see now? Are circling me. They began with Danny Joe Eberly's own brother, Lenny. What's the driver like? He's a white guy. A little guy. Brown hair. Lots of it. He's, he's kind of weird. Sneaky. Jumpy. Bingo. That's him. What good's this voodoo anyway? It won't bring our son back. We're sorry to put you through all this, but Lenny's really helping out. Is there anything special about the car? It's an old sedan. Light brown. Beige. It's driving around me again. It's scaring me. What else, Lenny? I can't see anything else. Look carefully at his clothes. What's he wearing? I don't know. Wait. He's wearing some sort of uniform. Yeah, it is. It's khaki colored. How many deviants has Thomas rounded up? 2,300 and counting. Well, now we can narrow them down to white males in uniform. When it was brought to our attention that it may be someone in uniform, we immediately went after garbage people, security people, janitors, and anyone that wore uniforms. And we put everyone under a microscope, including our own people.
My men were working double shifts. Some of them were triple shifts. There were times when we thought we may have him. Remember his M.O., people. He does his thing in the A.M. Wrestler could now see the image of the killer. Khaki uniform, good with his hands. Then, a lead came in confirming what Wrestler already knew. I began feeling that our offender would be working at Offutt Air Force Base. Uh, the guy would be working the night shift and probably getting off early in the morning. Hey, look. Ropes made in Korea. And guess who's the biggest customer? The Air Force. Now, how does the man know that? It's off at people, right under our noses. Look for E-2s, enlisted men under 30. Have anything like that on space? Anything at all? No, I don't believe. Nothing at all? It was pressure, day and night. Everyone had it on their mind all the time. If I parked downtown and got on my car, the first person I ran into would ask me, how's the case going? School vacation was approaching. Children would be out playing. A vulnerable time. Bob Ressler was sure the killer would attack soon. He was right. Hey, buddy. Help me? Lost. Oh yeah? Where do you want to go? Highway 6 bridge? Come on in and show me. Buy an ice cream? Ice cream? Give me a break. Get a hobby. Do as I say! You won't get her. Let me go, you dirtball! After the attack on the boy who fought for his life and survived pressure mounted, Wrestler still felt the killer was from off at air base, but he hadn't been able to smoke him out yet. Now he and the task force would launch a unique attack of their own. Our kids are afraid to go to school, even if we take them. We sweated every pervert at Offutt in five counties. Now what? We've got to shame this rat right out of his sewer. How? Think about it. Here's a guy with a big identity problem, right? The only way he gets his jollies is from dirty detective magazines, then attacking kids. So we'll challenge his manhood. That's right. That's where he's most sensitive. Let's play on that. I know this guy. I know he's going to do something to prove he's macho. And then he's ours. This for that big, brave killer of little boys. You're a tough guy, aren't you? Picking on defenseless little kids. I know why you don't pick on any real men. You don't have the guts. You're sick. You're the sickest individual I've ever had to contend with. You're spineless. Why don't you turn yourself in to a doctor, a minister, or to us? Why don't you climb out from under that stinking rock, you cowardly worm? The task force took the offensive by having Sheriff Thomas reach directly into the killer's mind. Uh, I felt that we had to do something to get this individual to surface. I felt that if I could taunt this person and have him try to do something to an adult, um, that maybe we would be much more successful because the adult would have a better opportunity to defend themselves. Come on, yellow belly, you sissy. Talk to me. Come on, you sicko. You are one sick boy. You always pick on the little ones, don't you? All the little ones, the little sissies, what you are. You're just a little sissy, a mama's boy. You're not a man. You're a little man, a little tiny man. Well, taunting an offender like this is a high risk but high gain. Uh, you want him to make a mistake, but you don't want him to kill again. On January 11, 1984, Jubert struck exactly as predicted. Come on, you sick. You talk to the man, you sissy. Talk to him, man, you sissy. Jubert was outside the church where Barbara Weaver was beginning her workday. She grew suspicious of the man lurking outside her window.
the taunts finally pushed John Jubert to his breaking point. Uh, give me the paper. Give, give me that paper! Get out of here! When Barbara Weaver pushed past John Jubert, she broke his control and escaped with her life. She also had his license number. Guy. I'll know him when I see him. John Jewett, go, go! Don't move, don't move! Ah! Get him down, get him down! In John Jubert's room, the task force found all the evidence Robert Ressler had predicted. It would establish Jubert's guilt. John Jubert, you're under arrest for the murder of Danny Joe Everly and Chris Baldwin. You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you. Do you understand these rights as I have described them? The last night when we had caught Jubert, had him in jail, and there's no doubt that he was the killer. And I got home and uh, my son, who was that age at the time, I guess he, he didn't like being stifled, but he also was under the effect of this fear in the community. And he, he, um, he stayed up till I got home, watched me on television that night, and he said, thanks, Dad. He was not very dangerous or aggressive looking, but he was extremely dangerous. Uh, and he had harbored the same fantasies and murderous tendencies that he had all along. John Jubert may have continued his rampage if it hadn't been for Robert Ressler's psychological profile revealing Jubert's inner conflicts patterns of violent behavior, and the vulnerabilities which finally led to his capture. In 1984, Jubert was convicted and sentenced to death for murdering Danny Joe Eberly and Chris Walden. Jubert, now 31 years of age, is in Nebraska State Penitentiary on death row. If the state of Nebraska is bound and determined to execute me, what can I do? I'm not about to take my own life to cheat them. Matter of fact, some people would probably cheer if I did that. It would save money on appeals. I'm Jim Sicking. Join me next week for another story from the Psych Files.